Joshua 13 tells us about these Philistines. So we see that Josiah is in bed with the Greeks. I'm calling them Greeks. Here, you'd understand why I call them Greeks. He's in bed with the Greeks, with the Philistines. Joshua 13 tells us that there are five laws of the Philistines. There are five lords. This is the territory that remains. All the districts of the Philistines and all those of the Geshurites, which is close to Egypt, the territory of Ekron on the north, are counted Canaanite, namely those of the five laws of the Philistines. And then he names them Gaza, Ashkelon, Gath, Ekron. First Samuel 6 also names them. The following were the golden hemorrhites that the Philistines paid as an indemnity to Yudhevavhe for Ashdod, one, for Gaza, one, for Ashkelon, one, for Gath, one, for Ekron, one. Okay. We get to Jeremiah. I read Jeremiah 25. Tell me what's changed. Pharaoh, king of Egypt, his courtiers, his officials, and all his people, all the mixed peoples, all the kings of the land of Uz, all the kings of the land of the Philistines, Ashkelon, Gaza, Ekron, Ashdod, has something changed? The gap is missing. Gath is missing. Beautiful. Zephaniah 25. Indeed, Gaza shall be deserted. Ashkelon, desolate. Ashdod's people shall be expelled in broad daylight, and Akron shall be uprooted. You notice the change here as well. Gath is missing. We have four instead of five. What's going on? So, in the late monaic and exilic texts, um, that is, those parts of the biblical writings in the late 7th and 6th century, okay, such as what we read, Jeremiah and Zephaniah, only four Philistine cities are mentioned, and God is left off the list. Likewise, 7th century Assyrian records refer only to Ashdod, Gaza, Ashkelon, and Ekron in their description of the Philistine cities or the territories. Gath is not mentioned at all. What happened? 2 Kings 12 tells us that during the reign of King Jehoash of Judah, that is around 830 BCE, Hazael, the king of Damascus, campaigned in the Shephelah and conquered the city of Gath. It tells us money brought, brought us as guilt offering or as a sin offering was not deposited in the house of Yudevavhe. It went to the priest. At that time, King Hazel of Aram came up and attacked Gath and captured it. So, what the biblical text tells us, we have confirmation of it in archaeology. The biblical report has been confirmed by archaeological excavation of Gath. The excavation showed that the site of ancient Gath suffered a major destruction toward the end of the 9th century BCE. That is why it's not mentioned in Zephaniah, it's not mentioned in Jeremiah. 
So Mr. Mark was correct. Gath was not important. Ekron was. Gath was important. So though Gath had previously been the most important city in the Shephelah, and possibly the largest of the entire country, God dramatically declined in size and importance in the following centuries. We know from Assyrian records that a century later, it was no more than a small town under the control of Ashdod. But in the 10th century, the time of the historical David, Philistine Gath seems to have been the most important regional power. This would have been around the time of the historical David. But the name of the king was not Ikasu or Ahish. So now we have seen the evidence of God, why David is mentioned alongside God, but why we don't see God play a huge role and Ekron is on the stage, brother. That's why this statement is important here, is what the writers were trying to do. They know that God was important. It's no longer important. They know that Ekron is important. It is still important. We are in bed with Ekron, or Josiah is in bed with Ekron. How do we explain as being in bed with them? Well, the founder, David had very good relations with the king of Gath. So they used that, moving the names around to make that connection that they wanted to make. David, we are told, served under these Philistines and fought one of them called Goliath. But the Philistines that we get described to us, uh, they, they, they are described to us in terms dramatically different from what we know of the Philistines in the early phases of their history. We get a description of the Philistine, but the description we get is weird. It does not fit. What description do we get? Let's read from the top, knowing the historical background about Gath and Ekron. And the Philistines assembled their camps to war, and they assembled at Sukkot, which belonged to Judah, and they account between Sukkot and Azekah in Ephes the Mayim. And Saul and the men of Israel assembled and they encamped in the valley of the Terebin. And they set the battle in array against the Philistines. Beautiful. And the Philistines were standing on the mountain from here and Israel was standing on the mountain from here and the valley was between them. And the champion emerged from the Philistines' camp named Goliath from Gath. Goliath is a Greek name. Put that in your spirit. His height was six cubits and a span. Okay. And a helmet of copper was on his head, and he was wearing a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of copper, and greaves of copper were on his legs, and a copper javelin was between his shoulders. And the shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and the spear's head was six hundred shekels of iron, 
and the shield bearer went before him. Does Goliath's description remind you of anything? Rabbi, the movie 300, he sounds like a Spartan. I was thinking he sounded like Nimrod or one of the great men of renown. Nimrod, 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 Nimrod. Okay, okay. So, we have a late 7th century composition that expresses the enemies of Judah in Josiah's time. Repeat the statement. What we've just read is a late seventh century composition that expresses the enemies of Judah in Josiah's time. What we get in here, you cannot put this description in the time of David. Talking about the Philistines. You see the difficulty. Mr. Jason picked something up. He's like, wait a second. Who are you describing? The Philistines of David's time? It cannot be. What we get is a description of the enemies of Judah in Josiah's time. Mr. Mark, this would be an anachronism, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't start. <laughs> you know, you know what I was thinking. Be, you know, to, to go along with um what Maury Jason had just said. We know what the war the most advanced warriors at that time looked like. Correct. The most advanced warriors at the time. You go. You can go back to the 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 Babylonian, the Assyrian walls, the Egyptian walls. We know what they look like. They certainly didn't look like that because I'm. I can guarantee you. Yeah, he would have been a champion if he had looked like that back in those days. <laughs> of course. But also, too, copper wasn't as. Cop, you know, copper is a, a later development, like towards the end of the Bronze Age, correct? Of, of, of around this seventh century time, yes. <laughs> like it wasn't. In, they wasn't dressing like this in the beginning, and yes. this type of warfare. You know what I mean? This warfare, yes. and you know why? You could see it on the Egyptian wall too, like when they were drawing. Um, the uh sea people coming in yes they have this type of armor and stuff with them like you you know what i mean you never connect it um you, you, you know you never connect it that way but it's like wow i just you not you never see it like that so the writer and this is why they say oh we know for a fact it's written during this time correct because these are things that a, a traditional religious person, we can't piece these things together. But somebody who knows the history and knows other cultures and what was going on at the time, they could easily spot this. That's that's amazing. Because we have the Philistines on the walls of Egypt. You know, when we go to um, Medinet Habu, we see a drawing of the Philistines, the Peleset. They wore a distinctive feather-topped headdresses. Instead of wearing bronze helmets, the palacet shown on the walls of the mortuary temple, what you see on the screen, of Ramses III in Upper Egypt, they wore distinctive feather-topped headdresses. 
instead of being heavily armored and carrying a spear, javelin, and so on. Also, they use Rabbi, a single spear. Quite. One second, and they come in. They, also, they use a single spear and do not wear the helmet, leg armor, known as greaves. Mr. Drew, please go ahead. Sorry for disturbing me. Uh, question I got to ask is, you know, I, I've, I've seen that before, but then I also seen it could be a headband and that's their hair sticking out the top, you know, with, with braids. You, you know what I'm saying? Because it looked like a feather. Everybody wearing feathers. I'm like, well, how many birds they had to pluck to get this feather cap? <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? So what, so what happened is it could be like a band to hold your braids up out of your face. Your face. Okay. And then that's your hair. You know what I'm saying? That's the yeah. braid, you know, the long, uh, long dreads or whatever. You know what I'm saying? And because uh, I've seen somebody, I've seen a live person dressed just like this, this post, this poster. I mean, sorry, this, yeah. uh, this, uh, this carving. Yes. And the dude had, he was dressed just like them. And I said, yes, that that's what it could be. It could be just a headband to hold your hair, your long locked hair, up. And then that's why all of them, everybody got it, you know, because everybody, you know, in that particular culture, everybody's wearing braids, everybody wearing plaits. And then it's long, you know, like a woman. But then what happened is when you're doing battle to get it out your eyes and get it out your way or somebody grab it, you know, you have it wrapped up and it looks like a, a headband. So that's possibly what it could be, too. Correct. So we we. This is why I'm saying we, um, the 12th, 11th century Philistines, how history shows them, we should distinguish them from 7th century, how the biblical text portrays them. Because they are the same people, they look different. Why do they look different? We'll find out. So this is what we have um, 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 on the walls of the mortuary temple of Ramses III in Upper Egypt. They don't look anything like what we read in 1 Samuel 17. What we read here, a helmet of copper, coat of mail, greaves of copper, copper javelin between his shoulders shaft of his sphere they're telling you his shield bearer these are Aegean weapons and armor from the mycenaean period you're looking at 1750 to 1050 bce to the classical times 510 to 323 in all these periods one can find metal helmets, metal armor, metal grooves. You can find them. So from 750 BCE to 323 BCE, you can find the list here. But it is only with the appearance of the heavily armed Greek hoplites of the 7th, the time the biblical text saying has been written, to the 5th century BCE, they become standard equipment that res resemble what Goliath is said to be wearing. So the description that we're getting is still narrowed to the 7th century BCE. It only appears here, this time frame. They're hoplites, hoplites. Is that how you pronounce that word? How you pronounce it? The hoplites. What was their standard accoutrements? 
a meta helmet, plate of armor, metal greaves, two spheres, a sword, a large shield. What does this tell us? The author of the biblical story of David and Goliath had an intimate knowledge of Greek hoplites of the late 7th century BC. And he's painting that picture onto the 10th century where David would have lived. Why are the Philistines looking Greek? What are they doing with Egypt? What's the connection there? Well, Greek mercenaries from the coast of Asia Minor came to play an increasingly important role in Near Eastern warfare. They played an important role. What do we know historically? Korean and Ionian mercenaries served in the Egyptian army and they were stationed in Egyptian border forts in the days of Semiticus I. And we know, as we started a class, that he took over the Philistine coast in the late 7th century BCE when the Assyrians were withdrawing. Okay. Herodotus states this, and he's supported by a wide range of archaeological evidence. What Herodotus stated is also supported by Assyrian sources, which points to Ladia as the source of these people. Lydia would be, you see on the screen where it says Antolia, you see how, how where Troy is, that is where the Assyrians are telling us that they came from. His name is always, it trusts me. Smeticus, the first, use these people as an important striking and occupation force. I mean, they were the elite. These Greek troops, that is why I call them Greeks at the beginning, these Greek troops were also used by the Babylonian kings in their massive armies and they use them as specialized fighting units. But Semiticus the first used them as an important striking and occupation force. This is how he used them. Now you could understand this, why the biblical author paints the picture that he painted with their heavy armor and aggressive tactics, the Greek hoplites embody the image of a threatening, arrogant enemy. And this view of them would have been all too well known to many Judahites of the late seventh century BCE. They would have known this. I mean, the appearance would shake anybody. 
as Madame Pam Pam Pamela Jean saying, with the special forces. So when the biblical writer haven't seen these Greek hoplites, how they've dressed, captures it, and he puts it in the story of David and Goliath. And then he tells the story from a genre that is also Greek. We're talking about the Philistines. And I'm calling them Greeks. Not only do we know that this is a 7th century portrayal of them, What do I mean but what do I mean that even how the author narrates the encounter is also Greek? What do I mean by that? Now when you close your eyes and you picture David and Goliath. I mean, what do you see in the modern sense? Oh, Mr. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Jesus says Spartacus. <laughs> True. We get all this detail and then it ends with choose for yourself a man and let him come down to me. Is this not how the Greeks and the Trojans fought in the uh, is it arenas that is the same picture that is painted here am I not the Philistine am I not the Greek and you the servant of Saul Choose for yourself a man and let him come down to me. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, we shall be slaves to you. And if I overcome him and kill him, you shall be slaves to us and serve us. And the Philistines said, I turned the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man and let us fight together. This is Greek influence. It reminds us of what we watch on TV or movies or read. Warfare, sorry, not warfare, warfare between Greeks and Trojans. In the movie Troy, that's true. It reminds us of the duel between Paris and Menelaus. Hector and Ajax, Nestor of Pylos. What we have here is a Homeric, you know, Homer, Homeric influence on the biblical authors. This influence is unlikely before the very late 8th century, but it grows increasingly during the 7th century, when Greeks became part of the Eastern Mediterranean scene. So that influence is influencing how the author 
It's telling the narrative. Seventh century realities put on 10th century historical figures if we make them historical. So now, I would have to prove that Judah had contact with these Greek missionaries, Greek hoplites. 